share my screen so that you see what I'm seeing. My name is Esther, like Brenda has said. I'm a trade lawyer by profession. I teach international business transactions, which, which we are going to cover today. In what I'm going to talk about today, I'm first going to talk about a sale of goods contract, generally, the legal aspects. What is a sale of goods contract? And then we'll talk about the international terms that international contracts of sale. And then we're going to talk about the bill of lending, which is very important, and the method of payment. And then we'll talk about the contract of services. Uh, I, it's very difficult to have an interactive session, but I'll be glad if you would stop me if you want further clarification so that I don't run through without you understanding. Like I said, I'm a lecturer, so I prefer being interrupted so that I explain better before I move on. Now, when we talk about a general contract for sale, we are talking about, for example, you going to the market to buy green paper, like you see that green paper there. So you, you are the buyer and you've gone to the seller in the market and you give the seller money, which is the price, and the seller gives you the green paper, that is a contract of sale. For as long as it's exchange of the money and the goods, that is a contract of sale. So in the domestic market, we all know what this is. Now, in law, we are very particular that you must have legal ownership of what you buy. And that's what we call transfer of property. This thing that I highlighted, transfer of property. In other words, it is different for you to have the green paper when you're not the owner. You could be just selling for someone. But we require that you have actual transfer of legal ownership. So even as we're going to talk about the laws today, we're going to emphasize that property must transfer, or what we call the property must pass. In other words, the legal ownership, if it's a car, for example, it is different if you are driving the car, you're in possession of the car, as opposed to you having the logbook of the car, meaning you're the owner. So when you have the legal ownership, when you have the logbook, it means that the property is yours. But when you're in possession of the property, you drive the car very well, but it doesn't belong to you. So in international transactions and in sale of good transactions, we emphasize the concept of passing of property. And therefore, we'll now look at specifically the international transactions. So when they realize that the world is doing trade, for example, a buyer in Uganda wants to sell to someone in Russia, they realized there was a lot of confusion. The International Chamber of Commerce realized that there was a lot of confusion that the people in Uganda did not know the laws that operate in Russia. Or the people who are buying things in India did not know what is, how the laws operate in Europe. So they came up with what they called international commercial terms or international commercial contracts, which we call INCO terms. And these were meant to streamline or to provide standard practice on how um, to provide standard practice on how trade is going to be done, on how selling and buying of goods is going to be done. So when we talk about the export contract, we are really focusing on the international contract terms or in the international contracts, which are called INCO terms. Now, the very first INCO terms were created in 1936, but over time, these have been repealed or changed or moderated to change with the changing world. So in 53, 1967, 76, 1990, 2000, these laws have been changed and add, to address existing contemporary issues. For example, now you'll find that we have a lot more technology involved than before. So the laws have been adjusted as such to provide for the change. And these INCO terms really by definition are standard, if you see what I'm highlighting now, they are standard contracts that are speci that specially define um, the international contracts are specifically defined and outline the obligations of exporters, you know. So in when you're carrying out a contract of export, when you decide that you want to export your bananas to Russia, or someone asks a question, you want to export your cocoa to Europe, you have to specifically specify what contract you're going to use, what INCO term you're going to use. And we say these INCO terms were created to create standard practice, you know, so that when you mention the INCO term like this, automatically the rest of the world know what are the terms and obligations of each party in the agreement. 
So in our study today, in the training today, we are going to focus on these different income terms. What are the different contracts that exist? And you go through, as you go through them, you realize that they vary and they are several, but at the end of the day, they still lead to the same thing. They point out the obligations of each member, of the buyer and the seller, the obligations of the exporter and the obligations of the importer. Now, inco terms, in actually, what they're saying by inco terms, they're saying that they are primarily designed for trade or mercantile convenience, to make it convenient, to make it easy, to provide a set of international rules to, for interpretation of the most commonly used trade terms in trade. And this is supposed to iron out any uncertainties in interpretation, okay? Now you find that most exporters in Uganda, what they do today, he wants to sell his bananas to Europe, he'll just go to Nile Cargo or to Salabate. You know, they'll go to a clearing agent or a transporter or freight forwarder. And they'll say, you know what? Take these things for me and deliver them to this place X. That is what they do. But what these, these, these Salabates or Nile Cargo people do, for them, they're the ones that actually in, implement the INCO terms. But you can do it yourself. And most of you, I'm sure, want to learn how to do it yourself. So when we talk, when we, we're going to learn about these terms or these contracts that exist and how they are effective. Now, like I said, you have to specify which particular INCO term you're using. You'll see that there are group C INCO terms, what I'm highlighting now. That's a category of INCO terms. You could say that for you, you're going to use a CIF contract, or you're going to use a CIP contract, or you're going to use a CFR contract. I'm going to define these contracts with time, so I just want to first briefly introduce them so that you know how they work. Then we have what they call the Group F contracts. All these are just categories. So you could have, you could say that for me, my contract with the guy I'm sending my products to in China, we're going to use that FAS contract, or we're going to use the FOB contract. Then we also have the X-Works contracts where you decide you're just producing and you're just selling the things to someone's warehouse. But we're going to define all these types of contracts much later. I want to just, at this point, just introduce them to you so that you know that they exist. So we have group C, we have group F, we have E, and then we also have D. Also, these are different terms of contracts. And all these form what we call the inco terms. So those, that's what they look like. All those small, small things, FOB, FAS, CPT, contract page two, all those are different types of international contracts. Now you as the seller or the exporter, you must decide what contract you're going to use with the buyer or with the importer, you must agree. So when you get in touch with the buyer, you agree what method of contract are we going to use? And once you agree, then it must be expressly stated in the agreement between you and the exporter and the importer. So when you specify this, it helps the rest of the world, everyone who's involved to understand their roles and responsibilities, because that is where the clarity comes from in international trade. Because everyone understands their roles and responsibilities, it means that there are not going to be a lot of friction. There's not going to be a lot of friction and conflict because everyone knows what is expected of them. So the CIF contract is the one that I want to start with because it's the most commonly used contract. It's the most commonly used in Cotan, and especially where it's, it's involving movement of goods over water. Ma majority of the goods we use or we, we send or receive in Uganda are through water marine. So the CIF is the most commonly used in Uganda and most places in the world. So we are going to focus on the CIF first so that you understand the rules and the responsibilities of the exporter and the importer. And when you talk about CIF, you're saying it is a contract that involves payment for cost, insurance, and freight. In other words, the price that you, the exporter, quotes for the importer is a total price that includes all these three. It includes the cost of the goods you're sending, the cocoa you're sending. It includes you carrying out the insurance for the cocoa to its destination. And it includes you paying for the transportation of the cocoa to its exportation. Now, the reason why the CIF is popular or most common is because you in Uganda as the exporter, you're the one who knows what, what transport pipe people to use, what insurance works. So the law requires that the exporter is the one responsible in the CIF contract for all these three costs. 
the cost of the goods, the purpose, the cost of ensuring those purpose until they reach their destination in Europe, and the cost of transporting them. So you, the exporter, you give a lump sum cost or price that includes all these three. And the importer, on the other hand, or the buyer in Europe, is only supposed to sit and wait for the products to arrive at the place they have nominated. Usually, it is a port. So the buyer nominates a port that these goods should arrive in, you know, London. And it is up to you to get them into London by giving a total cost of what these goods are going to be. And that cost includes freight, it includes insurance, and the actual cost of the goods. So that is what is peculiar, is unique about the CI contract. I hope I'm not running so fast. So if you look at our slide, you find that in the CIA contract, the responsibility of the seller or the exporter is what is highlighted as the orange. From the time the seller or exporter loads the goods, you meet that cost. You meet the cost of transporting the goods to the first carrier. Maybe that carrier is the, the, the person who's going to load them onto the ship. While they're on the ship, all this cost is met by the seller or the exporter until the goods arrive where they're supposed to arrive. So this entire cost is made by the exporter and it is calculated in the price you give the importer. Now, once the goods reach their arrival or the destination port that the buyer or the importer has specified, then the responsibility of the seller ends there, okay? So from that point onwards, the, as long as they reach the point of destination, the goods are now the responsibility of the importer. That is a CI contract. And like you said, it's popular because it is the exporter who knows the principles that apply in their country. So when they give you a lump sum cost, you as the importer, you all you have to do is just sit and listen and wait and wait for the goods to arrive. That's how you see, for example, Uganda, when we import goods from maybe cars from you know Singapore or Dubai, all we say is that the motorcade to say Mombasa. That is a CIF contract, Mombasa. Meaning that all you have to do, they give you a price quotation, which price quotation includes the actual cost of the car, it includes insuring that car on the high seas, and it includes transporting that car until the car arrives in Mombasa. So if it is CIF Mombasa, it means that you, the importer, you're waiting for your car to arrive in Mombasa, and as soon as it arrives in Mombasa, then it becomes your responsibility. So here, port of destination in this case would be Mombasa. The goods arrive in Mombasa, and as long as they're in Mombasa, now it's your responsibility to get a guy to drive the car or put it on a, a, a carrier to bring it to Kampala. If it is CIF Malawa, then the responsibility of that person who's bringing the car, the seller, brings it right up to Malawa. And for you, the buyer or the importer, your responsibility is from the moment the goods arrive in Malawa. So, this is a CIF contract. And those are the responsibilities of the CIF contract. There's a case, a landmark case that established what a CIF contract involves. So they were saying in that case that when an exporter import of goods enters into a CIF contract, the exporter is bound to do the following things. One, to make an invoice for the goods. So if you're exporting CIF, you're exporting your cocoa CIF to, to maybe London or to Europe, you're required to do an invoice. We're going to cover this in more detail. You're required to ship the goods to the port of shipment that they have said they want the goods to appear at. You're required to conclude the transport. You know, you organize your transportation people. Maybe you're going to use mask or you're going to use three-way shipping company that's of or DHL or FedEx. All that is your option for you. They give you the price included for that. Then you're required to carry out insurance. You, you take out insurance for those goods for the benefit of the importer. It is your responsibility as the exporter to do that. And then you're supposed to send all those documents to the buyer or to the importer as we're going to see. So this case established what is the responsibility of the exporter and importer under the CIF contract. So I want to focus on the key features of a CIF contract at this point. What, when they talk about a CIF, cost insurance and freight contract, what does it really mean? So this contract means that when they deliver the goods, I mean, when they deliver the documents, and by documents we are talking about 
the bill of lading, the policy of insurance, and the invoice, and other documents that you're going to see. When these documents have been achieved and obtained by the exporter, the exporter is required to send these documents to the seller, to the buyer, sorry. The exporter is required to send these documents to the importer. And once these documents have been sent to the importer, then in law, we say that the goods have been received by the importer. So for goods to be deemed to be received in law, it is established by receiving the documents as long as the contract in issue is a CIA contract. So this means if you're exporting your cocoa on the high seas and uh, there's maybe the, the ship catches fire, it will not be your responsibility as an exporter, you'll not be responsible for the loss of the cocoa if those documents were already sent to the importer. So in law legal ownership or transfer of ownership or what you see that like the law book ownership happens in a CIF contract once those goods have been sent, once the documents have been sent to the importer. So the peculiar thing or the unique thing about the CIF contract is that you don't wait for the car to reach Mombasa for you to say I have the car, no. As long as the exceller or the exporter has shipped the car and you are sent by DHL or otherwise, those documents have been sent to you, the bill of lading, the invoice, and all the other documents that you're going to see. Once you receive those documents, it means that you have ownership of the car. So if the car catches fire while it's still on the high seas, you who has the documents are the one to bear the loss. I hope that is very clear. That is the most important part. So there is no issue of conflict or disagreement in law over who is responsible at what point when damage happens. Because the CIA contract is clear. Once you have received documents of the CIA contract, you have legal ownership of the, 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 the product. So all that is necessary is for the exporter to deliver the documents to the importer. Once that has been done, then the importer is responsible in law for any damage that arises to those goods. So we are saying that this is because this is because property of the goods or legal ownership of the goods passes to the importer or to the buyer as soon as there's delivery of those documents. So once the documents are delivered, the goods become the property of the importer or buyer and the risk therefore transfers to the buyer. The buyer is then responsible for any risk of loss that happens as a result. And once the documents have been given to the importer, then the seller is entitled to be paid as we're going to see. Because what happens in practice is that once the importer receives these documents, the importer submits the documents to the bank, as we're going to see, and the bank makes payment to the seller, as we're going to see much later on today. So these are the key aspects that must be remembered in a CIF contract. Now here I want to focus on what is the responsibility of the exporter or the seller. You who is selling this product, what is your responsibility in law in this CIF contract? Because remember we said that the reason these contracts exist is so that it irons out any lack of clarification on any issue. So the CIF contract dictates the following terms, that one, goods that are shipped must be in conformity with the contract of sale. In other words, you the exporter, you're shipping the exact quality and quantity of the cocoa that is in the contract of sale. That is number one. So it is a responsibility of the seller or you the exporter to determine that the goods are in conformity. There is no otherwise, you know, the goods are the exact nature that the contract talks about. Then it is the responsibility of you the explorer and um, the exporter to prepare the goods to prepare the documents that must be sent. Remember we said when the documents are received, then legal ownership has passed. So it is the responsibility of the seller or exporter to prepare these documents. And by documents, we're talking about invoice, pre-shipment inspection, certificates, you know, contract of freight or carriage, contracts of insurance, all the relevant documents as we're going to see later on. It is the responsibility of the seller to get these documents together, to prepare them and to send them to the importer or to the buyer. Then the seller is also required in law to check the, cost, the product that they're sending, to make sure it has the right marks, the right quantity. You know, everything has been well packed, nothing is damaged, and they've been securely packed up, they're not damaged in route. So that is a responsibility of the seller. Then the seller incurs the costs of transporting the goods from the seller's warehouse 
or from your warehouse as the exporter, you incur the cost of transporting the goods to, for example, Mutukula, then from Mutukula to Mombasa, that is your cost, you as the exporter, you incur that cost of freighting the goods to the first port of loading, and then even contracting the goods to go to their point of destination. Remember, we said all this is calculated in the overall cost that you give the importer. Now, once you have done that as an exporter, you have marked the goods well, you have everything is ready, you have sent them off, you have shipped them, you must in law inform the importer. You must notify the importer that the goods have been shipped. And it's very important because the determined periods of time are very important because you must meet the shipping time according to the contract. What did the contract say? What did the contract say the shipping date is going to be? So you must meet the shipping date. So you inform the importer of the delivery of the cargo aboard on top of the ship and any other arrangements that are necessary for them to pick up the goods. So in other words, you tell them that the goods are arriving on this day, I put them on the ship, they're arriving on this day, make sure you have document X, Y, and Z and what, whatever is needed to be able to receive the goods. So this is the responsibility of the exporter in the contract. Then the exporter is also required to carry out the export license because it is the exporter that knows the laws in the export country. So the law requires that the exporter must do the export license. And it's the importer's duty usually to carry out the import license. So where export licenses are concerned, that's the responsibility of the exporter. And where import licenses are required, for example, you bring in your car into, from Mombasa into Uganda, it is you, the person who is importing the car, to deal with all the import procedures. You're not bothered by the export procedures at all. Did they follow the right procedures to take out the, the cargo to bring it to Uganda? No. You're only concerned about the import because that's the law, that's the country, you know. And the seller or the exporter is concerned about the country of export. Then it is a duty of the exporter to bear all the risks of damage until the goods pass the ship's rail, until the goods are loaded onto the ship. Then it's at that point, whereas the goods are still the responsibility of the seller or the exporter, it is an insurance company, as we are going to see later on today, that pays the insurance if they are damaged. But they are still under the responsibility of the seller. But here we are saying that all the risks is for as long as the goods are being moved, it is a responsibility of the seller until the goods cross the ship stream, until they cross the ship onto the, to move onto the ship. So the seller is also required to get any other relevant documents that are necessary or transit documents. Some countries require to have some transit document. For example, in the ESC, if you're going through, you need the commercial clearance. All those, it is a responsibility of the exporter to get them in the CIF contract. Now, the importer also has a responsibility in law. It's not only the exporter. Even the importer has a responsibility in law. What is the responsibility of the importer? One, he must, the importer must inform the sale of the shipping time and the ship, because it's the importer who nominates the ship. He's the one who says, okay, we're going to use ship X, Titanic X, and it leaves on day say, on, or maybe on December 3rd and sets off from Mombasa. So it is a responsibility of the seller to inform or to nominate the, of, I beg your pardon, it's a responsibility of the importer to, to not to tell the exporter of the ship you're using, the port of shipment you want to use and the shipping time. So that the exporter can make the relevant arrangements. And if the exporter fails, any additional costs that arise, for example, insurance or any costs on storage and all those extra costs, it's the responsibility of the importer because he's the one who's lacking in the matter, of the exporter, because he's the one who's lacking in the matter. I hope I'm not confusing you. So we are looking at obligations of the importer. What does the importer do? The importer is supposed to provide relevant information on cargo insurance. For example, you need to know, you know, what are your names, you know, date of birth, all those things you need to provide for insurance, you know, like passport identification or any other identification. It's a responsibility of you, the buyer or the importer, to notify the seller of those details that are used in the insurance process. Then the importer must also accept the travel documents, the transportation documents when they are sent. Because remember, we said when these documents arrive, they signify 
arrival of the goods. So the, the, the law requires that the importer or the buyer must accept these documents. And of course, once they receive the documents, they're required to pay the price. I'm looking at number four. So they must pay the agreed price once they receive these documents. And they must bear all the risk from the time the goods pass the ship's rail. So remember we said the seller, they are responsible for the goods until they pass the ship's rail. So once they pass the ship's rail, now the goods are the responsibility of the buyer. But like I said, because the goods are insured, any loss that happens during that time, the insurance company compensates. Number six, they have to pay all costs. The seller, the buyer has to pay all costs or duties or tax, taxes that are required. For example, if they are transit costs, they must be paid by the importer. If they are import costs or they are port costs at Mombasa, you need to pay some costs. It is the responsibility of the importer to pay all these costs. And of course, they must take delivery of the goods. That's the point number seven. When the goods are delivered or they have arrived, the actual goods, it's the responsibility of the buyer or the importer to go and pick them up or to take them from where the port of shipment that was agreed to in the contract. And then number nine, they must meet all costs from the time the goods are delivered. Maybe there are wharf charges or unloading costs, all those costs at Mombasa, it is the responsibility of the importer. So like I said, the CIF contract clearly defines whose role is what, and that is why it's very common, or that's why these import terms are very common or very popular because they iron out any conflict of, or lack of understanding. Each party has their own rules, I mean their own responsibilities, and they, they're supposed to carry out what they're supposed to carry out. Should they fail to do so, then the law gives remedies, or then the, the, the person who's not benefited is entitled to sue. So one of the documents that must be sent or must be procured is the invoice. So the exporter, you as an exporter, you must submit an invoice that shows the, the consignee with the agreed price, i.e. the cost of the goods, insurance, and cost. Remember, we're talking about the CIF. This invoice is very important because it's usually used for import purposes. So it's a law requires that you as an exporter must take out an invoice and must be in strict compliance with the terms of the contract. It has to be as exactly as stipulated in the contract because anything that is different between the invoice and the contract will create problems. So you as an exporter must make sure whatever you invoice is exactly what is agreed upon in the contract. If you find that there's a change that needs to be done, then that contract must also be changed. Of course, even the invoice must satisfy the official requirements of the country you're sending the goods to, because you'll find that some countries use this, like Uganda uses the invoices to determine the tax. So you must be, that the exporter, you must be cognizant of what is required in the invoice. And there should be a link between the invoice and the other documents like the bill of lading, the delivery note, all those must be synchronized and they must be reflecting the same thing. Now, the bill of lading is another important document that must be taken out by the seller or the exporter in a CIA contract. And the bill of lading is very important because it is the proof that you have shipped those documents. Because once what happens, how the bill of lading is created, when the seller or you, the exporter, take the, book, the goods to the shipper, you take the goods to Mombasa to be shipped, the people in Mombasa, the ship owner is the one who gives you this bill of lading. And when he gives you this bill of lading, he is showing that one, I have received the goods, they are in good contract, you know, they, are in, they, are, they have received the goods, they are in, in good condition, and I have seen exactly this kind of goods. These are the marks that identify the goods. So the bill of lading specifies the actual quality and quantity and nature of the goods. So once that you, the, 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 you, you the exporter, take these goods to the, to the port, to the shipper, to the shipping line, the shipper is the one who gives you this bill of lading. So this bill of lading is proof that you have delivered, you as the exporter, it is proof that you have delivered these goods to the vessel, point number one that you have delivered them. It is also evidence of the contract of courage. It's evidence that you have contracted, for example, in this example here, mask. You've contracted mask to actually ship these goods. So mask cannot wake up and deny that they never received the goods for as long as you have the bill of lading. The bill of lading shows that you actually contracted mask to take these goods to their destination. And it shows what destination it is in the details. And then it also shows that, you, you know, it is, a, it is a means of transferring rights in the goods while they're still in transit. In other words, the person who has this bill of lading is entitled to just give these goods away by handing over 
the bill of lading. That's why you find that when an import, when a buyer goes, for example, to Mombasa to receive goods, to receive a car that has come in, they'll ask you first for the bill of lading because when you have it, it shows you have ownership of the goods. So the bill of lading really is a, a, a demonstration that you have received the goods. And remember, even in the bank, for the buyer to be able to make payment, once he receives his goods, I mean, he receives the bill of lading, the bill of lading is submitted to the bank and the bank makes payment, as we're going to see later on. So what we're saying is that possession of the bill of lading is required to obtain the goods from the ship, from Mombasa. You go with the bill of lading and then they allow you to take the goods. In the same way, when you're exporting this bill of lading, which you send usually by FedEx, because the origin, it has to be in original. So you send it by DHL or FedEx. Once the importer receives the bill of lading, then they can claim the goods. So the law requires that when you do this bill of lading, it must be clean. In other words, it should not be conditional. It should be showing that the goods are excellent. You know, there is no issue with anything. Everything has been done. Once a bill has any, we call them reservations in law, or any conditions, or any things that are not clear, then that bill will not be accepted. So it has to be clear. What you deliver to the shipper must be clear. And then it must cover the whole journey. If, for example, it, the, it, it's, the goods are supposed to reach Ginger, and you first get them to Mombasa, and then you're getting another, and then Musk is also bringing them from Mombasa to Ginger, the bill of lading must cover the whole journey from Europe to Ginger, not stopping only in Mombasa. So it has to be covering the whole voyage for the goods up to the port point of destination. Of course, it must have the correct details, correct shipment dates, correct entries, names of people who, of the person who's receiving the goods and all those details. So in, in summary, what I'm saying is that the bill of lading is the most important document. It shows that you own the goods and that's why they, they make it in pause now. They even send you an electronic copy these days, but it's the original that you, you produce that shows that you actually are the contractual owner of these goods. Because we say, once you receive the documents, which is a bill of lading and the invoice and the other documents you're going to see, then you have ownership of the goods. And that's why you find that the, the, these, these documents arrive much earlier than the actual goods. So when they arrive, when you receive the bill of lading, then you are entitled to make payment. As soon as you receive them, then you instruct your bank to pay the importer. What are the different functions of the bill of lading? As I've said, one is a document of title. By document of title, we are saying that you have ownership, you have legal ownership of this bill of lading, of these goods, because you own the bill of lading. It's also a receipt, a receipt to show that actually the, 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 you, the exporter, you have submitted those goods to the shipper because remember it's a shipper that issues this bill of lading. It also shows a receipt of the kind of goods you are, what are the marks on the goods, what are the conditions of the goods, what are the quantities, all these are detailed in the bill of lading. So it's a receipt, it's a document of ownership or document of title. It's an evidence of the contract of transportation that you've contracted mass transport. And then it's also a contract of carriage because when masks write out this bill of lading, they're undertaking to deliver those goods or to transport those goods to their destination. That's why we say that it's a contract of courage. So in law, when we are looking at an export contract under the CIA, the thing that is most important is a bill of lading. Because whoever has it, has the goods. So if it is stolen, whoever steals and gets it is the one with the goods. That's how it is. That's why they send several versions. So they send a version to the bank, they send a version to you, the seller keeps a version, the shipper keeps a version, so that it is all synchronized to make sure that the person who holds it is the actual owner of the goods. Now, we said under CIA contract, we have the cost of the goods, we have the insurance of the goods and the freight, all that is a lump sum cost that is charged by the seller or the exporter. So you find that under insurance, it is a responsibility of the seller to take out the insurance on behalf of the importer. So when you do the CIF contract to the exporter, you're required to obtain insurance cover on behalf of the exporter and to provide the documents, the insurance documents to the, to the importer. So in the contract between you and the importer, the exporter and the importer, you must agree what kind of insurance they want to take out. Is it against fire? Is it a, but the, these details are going to be covered by my colleague much later on, so I'm not going to go into all that. But really what I want to emphasize here is that the CIF contract, the concept of the I is the insurance and it's the responsibility of the exporter to take out the insurance 
for the benefit of the, the importer. My colleague will cover all the issues that actually the two colleagues who are going to talk after me are going to talk about insurance. So I'll not go into that. I'll leave it for them to cover because they are more able than myself. So it, we said it's also the duty of the, imp, um, of the import exporter to carry out the export license. So depending on the importing and importing country laws, sometimes it's usually important to, or it's a requirement that there must be an export license or an import license. Now you find that the export license is usually required to be done by the exporter and the import license is a requirement that's done by the importer. That's a general practice that is carried out. Not many countries require export licenses, but some do. So those that do, if you're, if you're exporting in that country, our export promotion board people let us know whether we need an export license and if so, for which product, then you're supposed to carry out the export license yourself. So in the event that the exporter has sent the goods, you have sent your cocoa to London and you're not being paid, what remedies do you have in law? What can you do in law? One, you can sue for the price. So where a property is, where you have the documents have come to you, or the documents are not coming, but you have the contract, you can sue for the price. Or where you have delivered the documents as an exporter, you can sue for the price. Damages, you can also say, where the importer, where the other person refuses to accept the goods, you've sent them, they refuse them, you can sue to court for damages that, you know, I spent money, I did this, please compensate me because those guys have refused to accept my goods. That is a, a remedy you can, you can also achieve. What are the remedies of the importer, the person who's importing? If the goods have been sent and they are poor quality, you can reject the documents, which also represents rejection of the goods. So you have the right to reject the goods. That yes, they've sent them over to you, but they are not good quality. The person, the importer has the right to reject the goods. They also have the right to sue for damages or compensation. Compensation for failure to provide the right documents or to provide the right goods, or they ship the, the goods were shipped late, so they arrived late. You know, you are expecting the Christmas season that you make sales. And then the goods came after Christmas, you're entitled to sue for damages, or you're entitled to sue for defective goods, that the goods you received were poor quality goods, so you're entitled to sue for that. Now that concludes the CI contract in brief. I'm ready to take on questions during the Q&A. If there's anything that's not clear, I'll be ready to take it on. But in brief, we said the CIA cost insurance and freight, all those costs are covered by the exporter and it's through a lump sum that is given by the exporter. In the CIF contract, the responsibility of the exporter carries on until the goods cross the ship's rail. Once the goods fall onto the ship, then the responsibility falls on the importer. And we say that all this time when the goods are on the ship's rail, remember the goods are insured. So if there's any problem, the importer can still recover the damage from the insurance company. But at that point, the goods have already been sent and once in a CI contract, once the documents have been delivered to the buyer or the importer, then the goods have been deemed in law to be delivered to the importer. So now I want to talk about the FOB contract. CIF fell under the C INCO terms. Now let's talk about FOB, which is another popular contract under the F INCO terms. And here FOB, we are talking about free on board. In other words, the exporter agrees to deliver the goods until they reach the ship's rail. And once they reach the ship's rail, that's it. So the price that the exporter quotes in an FOB contract is only for the goods until they reach the ship's rail. So there is no quote, quotation for transportation from there. There's no quotation for insurance. So like we said, the price under FOB includes only the cost of the goods and all the cost, or costs up to boarding the ship. So all the cost of local transportation of the goods to the ship are bought by the, um, by the exporter in an FOB contract. But after that, they, they have no more business. So you find that the price quotation for an FOB contract is usually less than the price quotation for a CIF because the FOB does not include insurance and doesn't include freight or the, 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 the transportation. So this is what the FOB contract looks like. From the factory where your cocoa is being you know, cleaned and all that, you can kind of post for the, the old truck driver who takes it to Mombasa or to Malaba, wherever you agree, or the port of shipment. And once they reach the port of shipment, then the responsibility of the exporter ends there. 
From that point on, it is none of your business what happens to the products. And of course, at this point now, it's the importer's duty to contract their own shipper. So in this case, the, the, the importer looks for his own shipper. He looks for his own insurance. He looks for his own people to load and offload the goods of the ship. All that is a responsibility of the buyer. So the seller's responsibility only ends at this point when the goods have moved over the ship's rail. And therefore in law, in an FOB contract, legal ownership of the good passes as soon as the goods pass the ship's rail. Remember in the, F, in the CIF, we say that legal ownership happens once the documents have been delivered. Here in an FOB contract, legal ownership passes once the goods cross the ship's rail, the, the lining of the ship and they get onto the ship. So if the goods fall while they are being loaded onto the ship at this point, it is still the responsibility of the exporter because the legal ownership has not yet passed. But if they fall or they get damaged when they are on the ship or they cross this rail, this part, then it's a responsibility of the importer. So in an FOB contract, we are saying the exporter pays the cost and bears the responsibility of putting the goods onto the ship. And then it bears a cost for safety until the goods pass the ship's rail, that part. Once they pass the part of the ship to enter into the ship, then that's the responsibility of the importer. The sell, you as the exporter, your responsibility is over. And once they pass the ship's rail, the risk passes now to the importer. Everything after that is none of the seller's business. In practice, the seller also helps the, can help the buyer you know, to identify a shipper, to identify load um, um, and people to offload, excuse me, to identify people to offload and all that, but that is not the legal responsibility of um, an exporter in an FOB contract. So what are the duties of the exporter under FOB? The exporter only has to deliver the goods to the port of shipment. The exporter pays the handling costs to, you know, for the cranes to put the goods onto the ship. And then he has to ensure that goods are well packed and carefully loaded, you know. Then he must deliver the goods to the port of shipment on the date specified, because you know these ships live on specific days, or the loading happens on specific days. That the, the responsibility of the exporter is to make sure that goods arrive on the shipment on the date specified in the contract. Then the exporter is deemed to have delivered the goods when the goods, like I said, pass the ship's rail on the date of shipment. And once the exporter has put these goods onto the ship, he has in law to send a message to the buyer or the importer to notify them that his part is done. And then he's entitled to payment. So what are the remedies of an exporter and an FOB contract? You have sent the goods, you know, they have been, they breached the ship's rail and they are refusing to pay you. What remedy do you have as, as an exporter? So you can sue for non-payment if the goods have been over the ship, or you can sue for damages or compensation where the goods have been rejected. Because you could put the goods onto the ship, then the guy refuses to pick them up or to acknowledge receipt or to take them. You can sue for damages for non-acceptance of the goods. And then the remedies of the importer, maybe the goods are damaged or they were not sent on time, you know. You can reject the goods if they didn't arrive on time or if they are poor quality as an importer, but you can also ask for damages for damaged goods. So you can take the goods that are damaged, but also sue to court for compensation for the damage that you have. But what are the duties of the person who's importing under an FOB contract? One, you must nominate the ship. It's the duty of the importer under an FOB contract to nominate the ship, an effective ship. Of course, it's also the duty of the importer to secure shipping space, because remember we said, all that is not the business of the seller. That's the responsibility of the buyer or the importer. So they must nominate the ship. They must nominate or secure space on the ship. Then they must pay the price. Once the goods cross the ship's rail, the buyer or the, import, the, the exporter is entitled to payment. And then they must get, obtain the necessary licenses. If there's need to get an import license or import procedures, taxes, all that is the responsibility of the importer. It's not the responsibility of the exporter. So we said, how does risk of property pass legal ownership? We said legal ownership in an F or B contract passes as soon as the goods cross onto the ship. 
if they move the ship's rail or the edges of the ship and get into the ship, then the responsibility of the exporter in an FOB contract is finished. But if the, the, the reason people prefer the CIF contract over the FOB contract is because in the CIF contract, your pricing is higher. You know, you could get a shipper and you mark up a little bit on the shipping. You get an insurance, you mark up a little bit. Because remember in the CIF contract, you produce a lump sum to the importer. But in an FOB contract, your quotation is going to be strictly for the cost of your goods and transporting the goods and loading them onto the ship. So what you quote is much less. So even exporters prefer the CIF contract because they put, um, they put some markups a little, on, on each of these costs so that they make an overall bigger profit than originally. So these two contracts are the most common contracts. But you remember at the beginning, I told you that we have all these other different types of contracts, inco terms. We have the FCO inco terms, the free on board, free on board to a named port of shipment. We have the free carrier to a named place. We have free alongside ship. All these are different types. I have only explained two key types which are the most commonly used, the FOB and the CIA. Those are the most commonly used. But like I said, there are other inco terms, all these. You know, delivered a square, you deliver to a particular place, delivered duty unpaid, or delivered duty paid. They are just different variations, but all these have specific definitions or specific responsibilities, excuse me, <coughs> for each party. So it is a requirement in law that in the contract, you must specify which inco term you are using. Each person is supposed to specify in the contract, both parties are supposed to specify which contract they're going to use. Okay, I don't have some water here. I need to drink some water, but let's proceed. So those are the key contracts of export, the CIA contract and the FOB contract. Those are the key contracts of export that are used all over the world. They are very common, especially, for example, the goods receiving from China, most of them are CIF, you know, Mombasa, most of them. But now I want to talk about the methods of payment. So we have finished the contract part, the export contract, and how it relates to the importer. Now we're going to talk about the method of payment. How do you make payment when you're exporting? Or how are you paid as an exporter? You've sent your cocoa to China. How are you paid? Now, there are different ways of paying. It could be paid by check. We all know how a check operates, but most people are afraid of checks because they bounce. They used to be very popular those days, but not anymore. You be, could be paid by bank draft. We all know how bank drafts operate. You could be paid by telegraphic transfer, a TT. We know how that operates. You command your bank to make payment to. This is very common. The telegraphic transfers are very common. The, the, the importer commands their bank to send it wire money to your, to your account. This is just wired automatically. But in international transactions, the most common method used is what they call the letter of credit. Now, between the, telegra the telegraphic transfer is more recent than the letter of credit. But the letter of credit has been deemed to be secure, more secure than the telegraphic transfer. It protects both parties. So we are going to go through this letter of credit process and how it works, because the most common use most commonly used and it secures both the seller or the importer and the exporter. Both are secured because it has rules and conditions on how it operates. So we look at the letter of credit process. Now in a letter of credit, both parties, they contract to, pay, to make payment by letter of credit. In the agreement, you still have to specify that you're paying by letter of credit. Just like you specify that you're using a CIF contract or an FOB contract. So here, the parties must specify that they're going to pay by letter of credit. Mm -hmm. Now, in the letter of credit, I'm on point two. This process is quite elaborate, so I want us to go through it step by step. Now, in the letter of credit, you find that the importer here instructs his bank. Let's assume that, in, let's assume now, we, okay, you're sending your products from Uganda, you're sending cocoa from Uganda, and you're sending it to Germany. So in a letter of credit, your importer in Germany, the guy who's buying your cocoa in Germany, must instruct his bank, which is, let's say, Barclays Bank Germany, to open credit in favor of you, the exporter, Charles, 
with your bank, Barclays Bank in Uganda. I hope I'm being clear. I'm going to go through these processes very slowly. You, the exporter in Uganda, you have sent, you're sending your cocoa to Charles in Germany. So Charles in Germany instructs the issuing bank, which is Barclays Bank Germany, to open out a credit for you, Mary, who's sending your cocoa, and Charles will instruct Barclays Bank Germany to open credits in Barclays Bank Uganda on behalf of Mary. Okay, that's point number two. Now, number three here, we are saying that you, the, ex the importer, Charles in Germany, you give details to your Barclays Bank in Germany of the documents that Mary must produce. So you say you need a, see a bill of lading, you need an invoice, you need a delivery order, you need all the insurance policies, you need the pre-shipment inspection certificates, you need all the things that you need, all those documents. You, Charles, in Germany, you tell Barclays Bank Germany that, they, that Mary must produce those good, those, those documents to, must produce those documents to Barclays Bank Uganda. And then you, Charles, in Germany, must specify the date on which this letter of credit is going to expire. Because should Mary come for payment months later, that credit will have expired, she can't access the money. So there's always a window within which that money can be accessed. Now, point number four, the importer, which is Charles in Germany, you instruct your German bank that the exporter, who is Mary in Uganda, shall only be allowed to receive that money when they provide the documents to Barclays Bank Uganda. So once they provide their documents to Barclays Bank Uganda, remember the documents that you're supposed to ship or to send to the importer, the documents that show that legal ownership is passing, once those documents have been collected and finished, you send a copy usually to the bank. You as the exporter, you send a copy to the bank and you send a copy to the, ship, to the, 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 the person who's importing Charles in, China, in, in Germany. So here we are saying that you, the importer Charles, you instruct your bank, Barclays Bank in Germany, that Mary can only access this money when she brings that document you have stipulated. And those documents are given to Barclays Bank Uganda. So point number five, we are saying that Barclays Bank China instructs Barclays Bank Uganda to tell Mary that they have opened credit for her, okay? So Mary gets a confirmation from her bank here in Uganda that they've opened credit for her. And then the, the, the bank in Uganda, point number six, Barclays Bank Uganda tells Mary that this is, a, this is a policy you're going to use to be able to get the money, that this is what you need to do to be able to get the money. So point six is saying, Barclays Bank Uganda informs Mary that money has been opened for her benefit, and these are the terms that she's going to have to follow to be able to get this money. So the relationship is really between bank to bank, and Charles in Germany only comes in to instruct his bank and Mary here comes in in Uganda to show the bank that she has done the documentation that she has to do. So point number seven, when these goods have been put on the ship and the shipper has given, um, the shipper has given Mary the letters, the, the bill of lading and all the necessary documents. Point number seven is saying that the goods, once the, 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 the documents have been re received, Mary presents these documents and the invoice to Barclays Bank Uganda. So she takes her documents to Barclays Bank Uganda. Barclays Bank Uganda, point number eight, Barclays Bank Uganda looks at these documents to make sure they, are, they align with the contract. And then Barclays Bank sends these documents to Barclays Bank Germany. So the documents are wired to Germany for Barclays Bank to look at. Now Barclays Bank in Germany verifies the document to make sure this is what they were supposed to send and they have all been sent and that what is in the document is what is supposed to be in the document. Point number nine, if Germany is satisfied, the bank in Germany tells the bank in Uganda, you can release the money to Mary. So Mary is then notified that the money is now available, you can come and pick it up. So this is the most common method of payment, the letter of credit. Like I said, the telegraphic transfer also happens, but it puts both parties at a risk. Because you might have, if you're using a TT, usually send the money before the goods come. 
So what if you send the money and then the goods don't are not shipped, you know? So telegraphic transfer though used is quite unsafe. And then also the check bounces, although it is also used. Also the bank draft, you, because you see all these are, the relationship between an exporter and an importer is two people who are very far away, who have never seen each other most likely. And they've just been corresponding online or by you know email or whatever. So the letter of credit is the most common and most credible because it protects both parties. Because remember here, if the, if the exporter doesn't have the relevant documents, it means the goods are not on the ship. And the only way that the, the exporter gets the relevant documents is if the goods have been put on the ship and they have been signed off by the ship owner. So once these goods have been sent off by the ship owner, then it is guaranteed that the goods have been received by the ship so when the documents are received, it means that the goods have already passed to the importer. So the letter of credit is the most common use, the most common one, because of the way it protects both parties. There are different types of letters of credit. There is what they call the revocable and unconfirmed, which people don't like using because it can be revoked. You know, if you find that there's an issue, you can cancel the letter of credit. Or it's not confirmed, meaning if there's money, you get paid. If there's no money, you don't get paid. So number two, the one of irrevocable and confirmed is the one that is most used by, by, by the, the sellers and, and the exporters and importers. Because irrevocable meaning that cannot be canceled no matter what. Even if the goods are defective, that the exporter will still be paid. And then the importer can go to court and sue or can recover money from insurance. But this irrevocable and confirmed meaning it's confirmed that the money is there. It's confirmed that the letter of credit exists and it's confirmed that it's irrevocable. They can't cancel no matter what issue arises. The third part is a transferable letter of credit. Now this one is transferable meaning that once the buyer has a letter of credit or the, once the exporter has, the, has received the letter of credit, they can transfer it to someone else. Meaning they don't have to wait for the money to first be withdrawn and all that. They can just sign it off and the money is paid to someone else automatically. So it's transferable. Some of the principles of letters of credit for you to understand the letter of credit and how it applies is what they call the doctrine of autonomy. There's, the law says that, there's a, that, that the letter of credit is a separate arrangement from the goods and the sale of goods process. So even if the sale of goods process backfires, the letter of credit must be honored because it's an independent process. It's autonomous of the contract itself. In other words, even if the goods are defective or they're not delivered or they get damaged, the payment in the letter of credit must be done. And then therefore the, the, the importer is only left with other remedies in law, but not to cancel payment. The other doctrine of strict compliance is that the banks are under strict compliance to honor a letter of credit. In other words, the bank cannot wake up and say, oh, we've changed our mind, we don't have money. Once a letter of credit is confirmed and irrevocable, they have to honor that letter of credit no matter what. So that is a principle that applies with the letters of credit. And that's why they are credible in payment methods. Now that concludes the payment method. Unless someone has any other questions, I will be ready to answer them. But this generally is the payment process. And the most common I've said is the letter of credit. Yes, people use checks, they use drafts, telegraphic transfers are used, but all these are not as safe as the letter of credit. Because like we've said, the letter of credit is confirmed and irrevocable, meaning that the exporter will be paid no matter what. And then it also means that if the goods are not on the ship, they have not been shipped, then the person doesn't get payment. So there's no way you can be played as an importer or as an exporter because the, the systems have been put in place to take both parties.